This is the McFarlane Toys McFarlane Monster Series 3, The Six Faces of Madness, Jack the Ripper. One of the world's most notorious serial killers, noted more for the mystery surrounding his identity than his body count, brutally killed and mutilated at least five prostitutes with a straight razor on the dark, foggy, dangerous streets of 1888 London. Although it's the subject of much speculation to this day, Jack the Ripper's true identity remains unknown. The third series of the McFarlane Monsters action figure line focuses on the past, a historical look back at some of the human race's most notorious bloodletters and miscreants, incredibly detailed and fully accessorized. Before we get a closer stab, if you will, at Jack the Ripper, let's first figure out how tall the figure stands. We're going to put the tape measure right to the top of his head. There we go. The figure stands at 7.1 inches. If you are one that follows your monsters in centimeters, let's switch that all the way back. There we go. The figure stands exactly 18 inches in height. You get some pretty interesting accessories. Well, he gets two accessories, something I'll talk about a little bit in a second. And one thing that Jack the Ripper does also get is a rather interesting looking display base. I know it doesn't look like much right now, but we almost have like the, the uh, kind of slated flooring here. And it looks like almost a cobblestone around the outer edge there. A good dolloping there of splattered blood. You can see it's got some nice cracks when tilted just right, letting the light hit that just the right spot. You can see all these little chips and cracks and stuff like that in the stone. Now you ask yourself, hey, I see pegs, but I also see holes. What's going on with all these holes? There's three in the back, and then there's three right on the front. Let's delve deeper. He comes with all these component pieces. I say all, he only really comes with two other pieces. He comes with the bottom of the wall facing. There we go. And that just plugs into place like that. Then you can take the larger piece. And the best way to kind of line everything up is this triangle right here. This will be your dead giveaway. Uh, see what I did right there. The triangle, of course, will only sit on one place on the flooring. And then the triangle will then line it up with itself and peg itself into those three supplied holes. And you've got yourself a really neat looking diorama base. This is something that McFarlane was doing long before other companies delved into the idea of giving you dioramas with their figures. Unfortunately, the trade-off means that a figure such as Jack the Ripper doesn't have much in the way of posability. This is kind of one of those more show pieces than anything else. And certainly just looking at the display base on its own, there's a lot of show, if you will. Again, you've got the blood on the top. You've got some what looks to be almost blood there, but I think it's just the off-coloring of the brick facing. Can't certainly be all blood trickling its way down. Probably just a discoloration between the more darker gray bricks here and then just the brown, more almost rusted bricks on the side. You've got one part of what could be a full finished window, but the cracks on the side tells me that it's probably a shattered window. The paint is rather nice. Again, it's more of a dark pain. You can't really see anything behind it. And speaking of behind, we just flip it around. There's not a whole lot happening on the back, but you're really never going to see it from the back anyways. Now, there are pegs right here, and then there are, again, those three holes. We'll talk about that now. Jack the Ripper does come with a hat for one of his accessories. The hat, in theory, could fit on his head if it's something that you want to do, but it's something that you kind of have to press down on it seems almost like it's not supposed to be like that, but it does fit. Just want to make that known that it does fit over top of his head, if that's the look that you're wanting to go with. 
both online and in the pictures, Jack the Ripper is actually holding the hat in his hand. And to accomplish that, you can see that his hands are kind of hooked. You really just take the rim of the hat and you sit it over top of those fingers, kind of just resting them onto the hook. And he holds the hat in place. A rather interesting thing, though, is I just move that to the side. I just bring the packaging back into play here. You'll see that on the packaging, it looks as if he's holding a blade. And yet, I've looked all around. I looked in the packaging. I looked anything on the, around the, the floor area to see if I had dropped anything. I don't see any other accessories than the ones, of course, adorning his front here, which I'll talk about in, in a second as well. The only other accessory that he comes included with is his surgical bag, which as you can see, there's something inside that bag and it's dripping this blood coming out from the corner here. It's got some slash marks, probably maybe the work of somebody that tried to escape, clawed her way onto the bag there. The bag is crude and yet still effective. You've got the wrinkles on the sides, kind of looks more like stone than it does a bag. It's a nice gray there mixed in with the blacks. Of course, like I said, you've got that trail of blood that's coming out. The plastic here is thin, so this is not something that you're going to want to manipulate a whole lot with for a long period of time. Once you've pretty much got Jack planted on his display base, one of those things is just really a case you'll want to leave him alone. You don't want to be picking up and moving him around because really he's not going to have a lot of posability anyways. But nonetheless, I'll show you how everything sort of plugs into place in a second. There are those plug points there, and they're going to fit into the hole. I'll show you that in a second. But let's have a look at Jack the Ripper. Of course, that's the whole reasoning why you probably are checking out this review, is that you'll want to see Jack. Well, Jack does deliver in a really nice, nice, effective way. I did want to look at Jack initially first, and then... Just one thing led to another, and I ended up looking at Elizabeth Bathory first, and then from there it unraveled to Rasputin. But Jack the Ripper really was my character that I wanted to go and have a look at first and foremost. It just sort of worked its way out that it didn't. Uh, he's a nice looking figure. He is sort of relegated to what you can do with him. You can't move his arms. They sort of tease the fact that there are hinges there. I mean, to some extent you can move it, but if any long-time regulars to picking up McFarlane and collecting McFarlane figures, you sort of know what you're going to be getting. When you rotate his arms, for example, you're going to see a big definite cut. That doesn't look natural to me, so it sort of is telling you I got to keep things the way that they're going and leave them be. Face sculpt is rather nice, actually. Let's you know, zoom the camera in. Let's get some details going on here. Maniacal is a good word I'd like to use. Maniacal is a word I don't use very often, and yet I'm going to use it here for Jack the Ripper. A rather smart, deviant killer. Again, I don't think he was ever caught. Uh, there's speculation, of course, that Jack the Ripper revealed himself at one point, or that they were on the clues to picking out who Jack the Ripper was, but I think to this day, Jack the Ripper still eluded everybody as to who he actually was. Here it looks like he's got this big gash running through the side of his face. From first glances, it almost looks like he's got a monocle, but then it's when you start looking closer at it. No, it's not a monocle. He's just got this big gash through very bug eyes. Look at the size of this guy's eyes. Teeth are slightly crooked. You can see that he's got himself like almost a five o'clock shadow, and he's got some nice sprinkling of gray amongst his what little hair that he has on the on the, not the top, certainly on the sides of his head. Got a couple of these little gashes on the top. I'm not sure what those are supposed to be from. Of course, if he's killed people along the ways, he's probably has picked up, you know, some scarring for himself as well. His outfit is rather interesting because this is, of course, McFarlane's take on it. I can't imagine that Jack the Ripper would have been walking the 1800 streets of, uh, of London looking exactly like this, but this Jack the Ripper is depicted by wearing almost this, I want to say a, like a butcher's apron, splattered, splattered with blood. So sort of his calling card, I guess. McFarlane Toys loves his chains, and of course Jack the Ripper's got to have chains, uh, wielding all of his tools of the trade. 
Uh, a couple of things that we can look at here. We just fish around to the front. You've got what looks to be a small pair of clippers. I say small pair, a very dangerous pair of clippers. He's got himself a small knife, a much larger serrated knife. Almost looks like he's got a hacksaw, a pair of like giant clippers. And a notice thing as well that these clippers have a little bit of a loop on the bottom of them. I'm not really sure the reasoning why they, they have it like that. It could be that these are just simply crude weapons that he's come across along his ways, along his travels. And of course it looks like we've got like a, like a scalpel or a little surgical uh, tool there as well. But lots of blood, lots of blood here on Jack the Ripper. An interesting thing about this particular Jack the Ripper as well is that he's lost one of his feet. Again, not historically accurate, I'm sure, but something that McFarlane loves to sprinkle his own flavoring into. His flavoring so happens to make Jack the Ripper one peg leg. The peg leg has been very crudely put together. It looks like some nails, some boards, possibly some barbed wire just sort of wrapping everything together. And he's got blood coming down from the from the top. Now, that makes me wonder if this is a recent injury. You know, he's quickly crudely put together something, even though, like, his leg has just been clearly cut right off. Maybe he has suffered some gangrene, could have got a bit of an infection that he had to do his own surgical work, and ended up having to cost his own leg. So he took his leg right off and makeshifted this leg consisting of, again, like, this wrappings, Looks like there's a belt strapping there, some barbed wire, some chains, barbed wire there, and some nails and stuff like that. There's the undersides of his feet, peg holes on both of his feet, even though one of them is a little bit more finished, if you will, a little bit more functional, if you will, than the other. Looks like he's got himself some strapped, high-strapped boots. You can see that he's even painted those buckles and, and the little looplets here as well. I don't think this is something that you would wear back in 1888 myself, but again, that's something that McFarlane has taken upon himself to do. And of course, the finishing touches. Jack the Ripper's got himself a really nice olive-colored trench coat, which is slightly soft, but again, you can't really do too much with it other than just doing this. You could do that all afternoon if you really wanted to. Uh, articulation on this guy. Now, this is where it's going to sort of suffer. His head doesn't really rotate. I mean, it does rotate, but what are you really going to do when he's looking like this? I guess if you want, you could put the hat on top of him, sort of conceal that he's got like his head kind of slightly tilt, tilted down. That, I, I suppose, is somewhat effective. But again, like, you're really supposed to have the figure's head up like this. Same thing with the arms. I mean, the arms can swivel. Um, doesn't really look like the hands do all that much. They have a little bit of a swivel. Not really much, though. Uh, nothing in the way of the torso. Nothing, it seems, in the way of the legs, either. But, I mean, really, all of it is going to bank on the way that you're displaying the figure. So why don't we go ahead and do that right now. So we're going to go ahead and take the base that we've already discussed. Again, you've got those peg holes on the sides. I find it's actually easier to take the bag first and foremost and just take those. See so again, you've got the three pegs there. You're gonna line those three pegs up. If I can actually get my, eh, there we go, get my hand around it. And those pegs will just fit into place like that. You really don't wanna keep this resting on its own. First of all, it looks really creepy to have the bag just floating the way that it is. And then from there, you can go ahead and take Jack. You're gonna line up his feet like that and line up his peg right there. Again, this is so much easier if you're not doing this necessarily on camera. There we go. Maybe we'll put this back the way we found it. Pick that all in. And then from there, you're just really going to take the bag. And the bag really doesn't sit high enough. I mean, it's, it's sort of... Let me just show you what's happening here. The bag, he's got this little tiny hooked finger area that you... It's too tight of a plastic, you may actually have to heat it for him to properly hold the bag in place. Up to the point of just shooting this review, I wanted to show you how it looks directly out of packaging. You can kind of fake it, if you will, by having it just draped over his fingers, but you really definitely would need to heat that hand, pry the fingers apart, and then fit the bag handle in place. This would also mean that the blood coming down from the bag would be straighter and it's not going to look a little more 
lopsided the way that it is. Now again, without that knife, I don't even think he had one, but according to the packaging, he did come with this extra blade. So the other alternative, as the packaging does also show, is that you can take the hat and just fit it into his hand like that. It does give him something to hold on to. And uh, you know, you can just have it posed like that. This is sort of, again, one of those situations in which the figure is not gonna have posability to his effective means. Instead, this is sort of more a show figure than anything else. This is a figure that looks good. Even though it doesn't really do much, it looks really good. Which is one consistent trend that McFarlane has put into a lot of his older figures. And again, he is really, he was doing a lot of stuff before companies picked up on this. He was releasing horror characters long before the likes of, say, NECA and Mezco picked up licensing after the fact. But he was really like the godfather when it came to action figures. Even though I wouldn't technically call these action figures, they're certainly impressive looking figures, uh, more so from a show standpoint. And like I said, something that you can actually pose. Unlike Elizabeth Bathory and Rasputin that we've already had a look at in the Six Faces of Madness line, Jack the Ripper gets a rather neat looking diorama wall facing. This works perfectly for a character like Jack the Ripper because he was known for searching out his victims in the dark alleyways of London. Having him peering sort of around the side of a wall I think is the perfect fit for Jack the Ripper and it does look exceptionally good with him. This is a figure, of course, I have to stress this, is not something that you want to be posing and moving around. In fact, other than his arm, his arms and his head, there's really not much that you can move to the figure. But that's sort of the charm with the old McFarlane line. Anyone buying the old McFarlane figures sort of knows what they're getting themselves into. You're getting creepy, well-sculpted figures that I still think hold well up to this day. You're just limiting, unfortunately, the amount of posability that you can get from the figure, which I think is perfectly fine. I like Jack the Ripper, and I really wanted to have a look at him first. It just sort of worked its way out that I looked at the two figures that I just mentioned before having a look at this notorious killer. Uh, definitely will be looking forward to getting the rest of the Six Faces of Madness opened up, and I certainly hope you guys will be staying tuned to this channel for the month of Spotober as not only we have a look at the Six Faces of Madness lineup, but there's a whole ton of spooky goodness coming to this channel as well. The key is making sure you hit that creepy subscribe button down below. It's not really creepy, but maybe for the month of this, this month it could be creepy. Hit that little subscribe button down below. That will guarantee you that when new videos, especially spooky spots, are coming to this channel, you'll never miss out. And like I said, we're gonna do a whole bunch of stuff. This may very well be the largest spooky spot that I've done over the last couple of years. There's a whole lot of stuff going on. Stuff that I know of, stuff that you don't know of, but let me just tell you this, there's probably, I would say there's at least a third more stuff we're gonna be looking at this year than we did the previous years of, of Spooky Spots. It's sort of a tradition on this channel that every October, we of course look at some creepy looking items and I hope you guys will stay tuned as we have a look at them on this channel. As always guys, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.